You are now entering Maximum Driftcast, the only drifting podcast hosted by a Spanish soccer mom, a 30-year-old silver-haired fox going on 60, and finally, a 200-pound bowl of spaghetti with chimichanga arms. The champions, the champions, we are the champions. Welcome to Outback Steakhouse. I'm your host... Josh Robinson, how can I? What? Corey, what? Why should I take? What, what? How can I get from you? Paco, you ruined my bit. I was gonna do a bit <laughs> that was funnier. Um, <laughs> uh, can we start over? Can re- we start over? Re- re- do it. Welcome to Maximum Driftcast, the only drifting podcast that brings you the winner of Formula no, Drift. Oh. No, just don't say it's Josh. Just say um, just like do like a generic intro. We should have talked about this before. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, welcome to Maximum Drift, because the only drifting podcast that doesn't have a guest today, Sam. That's that's right. It's just you and me, Paco and Corey and Corey. I just want to say I'm really proud of you for finally going to those speech therapy classes to get rid of your stupid voice. You finally sound like a gentleman, and also you've been hitting the gym, and I've noticed that you've just been doing really well in Pro Two. So new Corey. You're way better than old Corey. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great to see you guys. We see wow. you every week, Corey. Don't be so surprised. <laughs> Corey, uh, what, who's who's your uh, who's your personal trainer? <laughs> yes, I just went on the biggest loser. Uh, it's also my drifting career, and uh, so far so good. <laughs> Well, we're happy to have you, Corey slash Josh. Uh, the gig is up. Paco blew it for everyone. Sorry about Paco. <sighs> but uh, we have Josh Robinson, winner of Formula Drift Atlanta Pro 2 and friend of the show. We have talked to him about a year ago about his ute life and his uh, down under kisses and, you know, you name it. But Josh is here. What's up, man? Thanks so much, guys. It's great to see you all. Uh, yeah, life's good. Very busy as always. Uh, Formula Drift is no joke. It's a, a big trip of being out here and, and doing this, but always ready to catch up with you guys and uh, see what's going on. Nothing. Yeah, All right, that's it. Real. <laughs> cool. Perfect. Later. Hey, boom. <laughs> good show. Thanks for tuning in, Maximum Driftcast. Josh, <clears throat> you just won one of the messiest uh, rounds of FD I've seen in a while in terms of rain and mud and weather and all that. What? Uh, <laughs> tell us what went down out there. Yeah, it was pretty wild uh, in qualifying on Thursday night. Just the first half of the field had a clean run and then, or probably the first quarter of the field had a clean run and then the heavens opened. It got, uh, well, the event got postponed for 30 minutes while they waited for the really bad front to go through. And then after that, it was just super slippery. It kind of started to dry up a little bit. And then it just went back to full wet conditions again in the second didn't, half. Didn't you get boned in qualifying? Like some guys got semi-dry runs or dry runs, and then you kind of got screwed twice, right? Yeah, but I mean, that's drifting, man. Like it always, it always yeah, happens. Like you've, got 40, you've got 40 guys in the field. Like someone's going to have that story. Someone's going <laughs> to get the clean run. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's definitely sure like... Point, that's a big bummer for the the odds to go against you in that way is that some drivers got like a fresh run and actually got to put down tire smoke. And I know the judges try to judge their best, you know, they'll they'll give a 90 point run in the rain if they see a 90 point run in the rain, just kind of have to. That's that's their difficult job. But of course, you always want to try to have at least one clean run rather than a two rainy runs when some guys get a clean run. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I took it easy my first run for sure because I had seen that the previous 20 drivers before me, no one had managed to put a score on the board. So I went out and just went like three tenths and managed to get a 69 in my first run. Hey. Uh, so, hey, you. so the fact <laughs> that I put down a score, my guys was like, hell yeah, like we're going through to the main event. But the problem was that there were uh, all those drivers before me that had a run in the dry and they'd put down semi-respectable scores and they were in the uh, the 80s and, oh yeah, 70s and 80s. And so a 69, I think, put me in eighth qualifying position after the first run, and which was all great until the track started to dry out and guys started to get their second run. And then that 69 very quickly um, like pushed out of the top 16 I think I was about 15th place before I went out for my second run, and then I did a 74 or six or something like that in my second pass, and I just managed to just uh, sneak through to the main event. 
Yeah, and you, you know, you qualified 15th. You almost didn't make it into the show, which is pretty crazy to think. We, we've discussed that a little bit the past few weeks since uh, Pro 2 is now highly elevated over the previous years of competition level. And uh, it's like the guys, I feel like in the past, like out of the top 16, you know, there'd be, you know, some guys that just weren't nearly as good as the, you know, the bottom eight of the top 16 was usually not nearly as good as a top eight, kind of like the the bottom 16 of pro top 32. You could pretty much generally say that the top 16 are generally usually better drivers. But this year, it seems like all 16 dudes in top 16 are strong and it's extremely fierce. And there's usually another 10 to 16 other drivers that aren't even making it into the show, which did you, you didn't, did you make it into the show in Orlando? Yeah, I did. What? Uh, and, and you're right there because, I mean, <clears throat> there's 40 drivers in Pro 2 this year. So yeah. 24 drivers are going to go home disappointed uh, without even making the main event. So it's definitely, you've got your work cut out for you to put down a couple of good runs in qualifying, particularly when you only get, uh, like, maybe worst case scenario, three practice runs before qualifying. Um, so for a driver that hasn't seen the track before, Maybe they're debuting a new car this year. Uh, they haven't driven on a track of that style before. To then go out first time, maybe with that team, maybe a first time driving a new track, maybe a, a brand new car. If you get between three and six passes before you go out for that uh, qualifying run, then there's a really good chance that you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> By the Marco, way, what you got? before we go, uh, we have a very, very rude user here on Facebook. It's talking shit oh, already. No. Yeah. Uh, we, I'm going to have to say his name because we're going to put him in shame publicly. Adam, yeah, Adam Lizote Zeisler. Oh, no. Yeah, he's, he's saying, is there an issue with his mic or is that just his voice? Wow. So rude. <laughs> Wait, is he talking about me or Josh? <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's, a talk it's about you, Sam. <laughs> oh. Well... It's it's guess, it. Josh is a very deep uh, Robo Roo robotic ro voice. Yeah, yeah, Adam. Adam, this is what your voice will sound like when you reach PV as well, buddy. Don't worry, you'll have a Which uh, which chat is that in? I'm trying to global ban. That's on Facebook. All right, I'm gonna give him the global ban then. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing would make me happier. Thank you, <laughs> Not that make you happier. Are you are you one of the LZ haters? No, we're good mates, but holy shit, do we uh, do we go for the jugular? We've got a little bit of a, a rivalry going on behind the scenes that not too many people have seen. So uh, jugular is that the area behind the balls? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's right. exactly what the jugular said, Sam. Yes. Like, wait, wait, what'd you call it, Paco? Huh? The, what'd you call it? The the jugular. <laughs> jugular. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know that Adam's last name was uh, Lizard Skin. What well, no, is it? Um, Liz, Liz, Lizot Zeis, Zeisler before, before this. I can see why he changed it. It's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make his fans any angrier with me. I've got, like, now it's, the, it's taken the place of the angry uh, angry Michael fans from New Zealand. It's like now, now the LZ <laughs> fans are after me after our fake Bruja on his episode. So yeah, oh, we well. probably yeah. had a record, uh, record of uh, hate messages on, on our comment section from you shitting on, on always, <laughs> always, always W track. I know it's rough. I've been told never to go back to Orlando, which is fine. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh, let's continue on your uh, path to victory. So you, you know, you squeak through and qualify and, and then uh, tell us about your your day. Was the car working? How were your battles before they began? Practice go good? Uh, yeah, practice was all good. Um, for us, it was just a case of getting the setup dialed in. Because of the size, uh, like the wheelbase and the weight of the car, it's always going to be a hassle trying to keep up with other cars. So our biggest issue was trying to have the pace after turn one to carry that through up the hill. And that was why I went through one more time in my first battle, was just trying to uh, get through that first transition as fast as possible and get the car up the hill uh, into the horseshoe and stay on door up there. And so that was an issue. We kept on dropping tire pressures and messing around with the setup. 
Um, Bob and Alex and Rob were working overtime in the pits, trying to do everything we could just to get that uh, as fast as we could through that transition because we just kept on losing pace there. We could match it going down the hill. That wasn't an issue. But obviously the lead car has to slow down a certain amount to get the grip to transition and get back up the hill. Uh, and all the other cars are many hundreds of pounds lighter and a shorter wheelbase than us. And so it just makes that a, a difficult thing to achieve. Uh, but yeah, after the, the third one more time, we had the setup <laughs> dialed in even more. And then after that, um, it was fairly smooth sailing from there on out. And what was uh, what were the conditions for that, and how was battling Rome? Have you have you ever uh, driven against him before? Or was that a new, new uh, battle? Uh, I didn't. What was it from? Sorry, it was Alex. Orlando. Yeah, I was looking. Uh, yeah, yeah, Rome was in uh, Orlando, so uh, we haven't battled Alec Robbins before. So that was uh, a good one to go up against for sure, and it gave us those runs just to get the, the setup dialed a bit more to, to get the pace. I only had. I think it was two chase runs before we went into competition. So we thought that we had the pace, we had it dialed in as, as good as it needed to be. But obviously getting those extra few runs in, unfortunately during the main event, but uh, getting a few extra runs in gave us a bit of an indication of where the car needed to be at and the guys adapted to that and off we went. And is your car different than previous iterations of this car, like 2018 setup? What have you dialed or changed? Or is there still that big old robo Roo? Uh, no, we keep on making adjustments to it. So this year, uh, the car got rewired just to get rid of some gremlins that we had in previous years. Uh, Texas Speed refreshed the motor for us and got all that looking uh, sharp and back up to full power. So that's good. In terms of the setup, uh, FIGS Engineering have done for the suspension work for us. BC Racing have given us a, a, a new setup um, to run this year. And uh, Bob, my crew chief, has been working on the steering setup as well. So in terms of the weight of the car, the overall weight hasn't changed. There's not a whole lot more we can do there without throwing eye-watering sums of cash at it. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's more reliable and it handles better. So we're doing the best we can with, with um, the shortcomings we have with that chassis. And for those that didn't listen to our first show with Josh a year ago, uh, Josh drives a pretty unique car. Tell us a bit about your your drift missile. Not missile, but you know, your, your pro car. Uh, so it's a Holden <laughs> Ute. It's the Australian El Camino. It's based on a Chevy SS and a Pontiac G8 platform. They're unique to my country. And the reason they're so popular out there is because we don't have things like Ford F250 pickup like full-size trucks that you call it in America. So that's the kind of a vehicle that the guys around our age will drive. It really uh, is the perfect road. car. It's, it's like, uh, I would I would totally rock one if they're available here. <laughs> well, yeah, and the latest, the latest Model 1s came with a supercharged LSA from the factory. Yeah. So they go like crazy. Uh, you can put two people in them, and you can throw a couple of jet skis or a couple <laughs> of dirt bikes in the back and go do your thing. So... The platform does make a lot of sense, just not the drifting. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna play a word game with you. Uh, we talked about it last show. This is gonna be kind of like a quiz. Um, just finish the statement for me, Josh. Are you ready? <laughs> it's gonna get me into trouble. I can already tell. No, no, no. I'll be fine. So Josh, the front is like a car, right? Yep. The back is like a truck. Mm -hmm. The front is where I drive. The back is where I party <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> rhyme but i'll allow it i didn't realize that we're telling bedtime stories here and it is to rhyme no it's, it's fine I just, I just thought that you know I, you were last time one of my favorite guests but i guess uh, things change <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a YouTube super que uh, super chat question from Adrian C two six two three. Super chat is active. If you want to get a question into Josh, that we will definitely ask him, no matter how rude it is. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> um, there was a lot of rude ones during Adam LC's. That was fun. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to, Cheers. just uh, Cheers. Yeah, just uh, just uh, do a, a whatever size donation minimum is uh, three thousand dollars. And we'll make sure to read your question. Um, and, of course, you can always ask questions on Instagram and Facebook, but we can't get to every question. This is just a way to make sure we get to it. Um, and Adrian says, who is better at milking the ruse, LZ or Robinson? The world must know. 
Can you milk a roux? <laughs> you can milk anything with nipples, Paco. Really? That's what. That's what. Um, what was that movie with Ben Stiller? Yeah, I've seen like I've seen this in a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, according to LZ's Instagram story, he's Australia's most wanted, so I can only assume that that's the reason. Yeah, because I guess he was street sharking <coughs> down there. Were you down there? Uh, I, was, I, was, I was over here holding in the fort in the US of A. What's, uh, you, you mentioned you guys are best friends slash nemesis. What's the story there? Uh, I think it just gets that Australians have a good sense of humor. You can... Uh, give us a bunch of shit and we take it with a smile and then dish it back tenfold. <laughs> and I sure think um, that just suits his personality well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's one of the fun things about uh, about this uh, this series, like the the friendships that happen between drivers. You know, like in, in other in other auto series, there's there's like more beef. Like usually, you don't see teams talking to each other, helping each other. And that's one of the things about Formula Drift that seems very cool. And especially right now on Pro 2, it seems like, you know, there, there's more just like groups of dudes just, uh, and, and, and ladies, uh, you know, just, just having fun, helping each other and having a good time. Would you, would you think, like, do you think Pro 2 guys have more fun in that aspect than Pro guys or? Yes, I know. I think the the, the, like the mateship and the camaraderie amongst everyone is definitely very strong because everyone understands just how difficult it is. I think when you watch it from a live stream perspective, just naturally you relate it to whatever you know. So if you compete in Australia in like Big Drift or the Australian Drifting Grand Prix or like whatever your local series is, uh, or if you're in the US and you compete in Top Drift or Lone Star Drift or something like that, when you watch it on the live stream, you just assume that it's like what your local series is. But then when you get there, you realize that it's 50-fold harder and the, the level of commitment involved in terms of your time and budgets and all that jazz. So the, the mateship amongst the teams is really, really high because everyone knows what each other is going through and that there's 10,000 potential points of failure in a single weekend. And so you can't cover all of your bases. So if someone needs a a mil-spec connector or a wiring harness or a turbo or whatever it is, you can go to any of those teams and anyone will happily help you out because but you can't cover all of your bases. As I said, like there's, there's 10,000 potential points of failure on that car on any given weekend. You might have a 1,000 of those covered, but outside of that, you're going to be stuck. And so I think that's why the, uh, like the, the level of friendship and willingness to help one another out is so high because everyone knows what the... The, the pain you go through to be there and everyone just wants to like help each other to get that car to the start line. I mean, I think that's, that's a really good question, Paco, because it's, it's, uh, you know, you have to wonder, it's like everyone is obviously trying to get into pro one. No one's just like in pro two. It's like, I'm going to dominate pro two for all time. Like everyone wants to go to the next level. Um, but of course they, they still have, maybe less stress in some regards, but also much more stress because you probably don't have an unlimited amount of money unless you're like Adam who just sells drugs on the side. And <laughs> the little, <laughs> yeah, the cartel. True. I don't think it's true at least. Um, but, it, but there is probably some level of fun. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, when I was a, a beginning filmmaker, if I could, I feel weird to call myself that, but it's like, yeah, there was fun in only having a like, cheap camera and only doing this level of thing and then and then just there's more stress when you have more money and more people relying on you for stuff and and you know i was borrowing lenses from people at every event just to try to get shots and it's not that that's a good equivalent to pro 2 but it's all i can really relate to it but i imagine that it, it causes a lot of camaraderie in the fact that not everyone has a full set of spares for their cars. Like I'm sure you and all the other LS bros are on pretty good terms because <laughs> you, you you have to uh, share parts when necessary, and you know it's a, it's an interesting dynamic to think about for sure. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't discount too much in even Pro Two to be honest, but the level of equipment from those guys is is pretty huge, and they don't have um, perhaps the level of sponsorships that the Pro One guys have. And they don't have the social media following and things like that. So all that makes Pro 2 uh, still hard. But then on the flip side in Pro 1, I saw like Forrest Wang, for example, put down a 94-point qualifying run. And I think he was in 12th place or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so it was like crazy the, for points. 
Yeah, it's like, oh, if you're not uh, at 95 or higher, like, it's just it's just insane. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think the, like, the the stresses are there regardless of what you're driving in and what you're doing. Like the, the guys at the bottom of the Pro 2 is still probably hating life just as much as someone that's fighting yeah. the fight in Pro 1. Yeah, and the Pro 2 dudes this year look better than most of the Pro 1 guys just, you know, maybe five short years ago. So it's it's really cool to see the progression in that. I feel like a lot of you guys still obviously need more time in doing tandem with your Pro cars. Because, you know, I see I see a lot of Pro 2 drivers do crazy-ass tandems in their missiles. But the tandem battles oftentimes, even with, with dry ground, are just not nearly as exciting as the Pro 1 battles. But that is also to say the Pro 1 battles have gotten absolutely insane lately, too, is that, you know. It's just constantly door to door. That if you they aren't door to door, you're like, huh, that's that's weird at this point. So I guess maybe that's all I'm seeing. But um, yeah, I, I wish that uh, you guys could get more time. And I really wish there was a Pro Two Top Thirty Two at this point. I think that that would be beneficial for everyone now that there's 40 drivers that are competing. To be honest, I don't agree with you on that. I think oh the fuck you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> Actually, here's the screenshot for the episode. You ready? <laughs> uh, get it one, two, two, boom. What is that? What is that? A Victoria bitter? What is a Victoria bitter? Is that yeah. a is that a rue drink? Is that made of rue milk? Uh, uh, yeah, it is. It's uh, the golden nectar. It's mm. The drink, drink of my country, of my people. The golden no. nectar. So the, explain the to go- me. Golden, the golden nectar. So uh, explain yes, so I... your incorrect fact, real quick. So. I, I see it in a lot of the comments online and things like that. Like guys want a, uh, a top 32 for Pro 2. I still don't think it's quite there yet. I think it would be awesome if you had like the, the bottom 16 could still like throw down and, and put on a non-sketchy run. But I think the reality is that the guys that are qualifying in 32nd position in Pro 2 at the moment, they've probably got a zero on one run and uh, like a, a 20 or 40 point run in their second run. And yeah. you're just risking the, the weekend of the guy that threw down and, and qualified in the top eight by making him go up against someone um, that could very easily like miss on the side of his car or uh, uh, like spin in front of them and and cost the other guy his weekend. Yeah, I and the other thing is like the, like everyone from the spectators to the track staff to the judges all say like goddamn pro two like why do you take so long and blah 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 uh, and they complain about how the event drags on for pro 2 and that's just with how it is at the moment with a with a top 16 i think that if they wanted to fix it it would have to maybe go one of two ways one would be to somehow like get the if they, if they wanted to run top 32 get the bottom 16 to battle each other and then like the, the top couple have a wild card and somehow come into the top 16 um but in terms of putting number one against number 32 i don't think it's quite there yet yeah, I just was thinking uh, that totally makes sense. I just was thinking that uh, you know I want guys to get seat time. I, I worry about the dudes that are putting it out there and have accomplished their dream of getting into Pro Two and just either through bad luck or just not getting enough runs on the track, they're just not gonna see their dreams fulfilled just because they're for one reason or another are not getting that track time. Like you said, you got like what three runs before qualifying. Yep, and that's not uncommon at all. And yeah. the crazy thing is though, when you sit down and like put your pocket watch to it at Road Atlanta or at Orlando, from the moment you initiate to the moment you go across the finish line is about 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah, so and one so, minute of driving, perhaps, is your entire weekend and, and, that you spent $10,000 to get to. And it's like, that sucks. But And that's, that's, and that's exactly right. And the thing is, by having a, a fuel of 40 drivers, it means that uh, the, the track time is greatly, greatly reduced. Mm. Because if you have a, a one 90-minute practice session and you've got 40 cars, at a track like Orlando, guys are going to hit the wall. At a track like uh, Road Atlanta, half the field is going to go into the kitty litter. And so guys were getting one run in an hour and a half. Or yeah. like a few guys were lucky and got two runs in an hour and a half. And so you're sitting there in a hot race car for an hour and a half to get yeah. one pass. And that was one of the big so considerations. Think, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so I think um, like maybe condensing the size of the field for to make it less than 40 cars mm-hmm. would be good. Or give the guys more practice, uh, more track time before qualifying. Yeah, I think they might have to be more strict on Pro 2 licenses now that we've got 40 dudes that, you know, I feel like Pro 2 is 
not going to be something that a lot of these dudes just try once. I mean, it's, it's thankfully, it is expensive, but it's thankfully also cheap enough that it's like if you do poorly this year, you're probably not just going to do one and done. Like, you're going to keep trying for another few years, I would hope, unless you're Corey. But um, <clears throat> he's not here. I can say what I want. <laughs> um, but yeah, but the, like the kitty litter and the skill level thing, that was like one of our big considerations for um, the Grid Life Drift Draft that we did this year. Um, when we partnered up with Grid Life in that, we were trying to help them select uh, out of like the hundred or so drivers that wanted to come, we had to like pick 40. And of course they want, you know, pro one guys, they want pro two guys, they want guys that have never competed professionally, but are also badass drifters. But the whole point of like being selective in the field and also being very selective about like the different levels, because I do want all levels is one guy goes in the kitty litter, the rest of the session's done because there's only yeah. like four sessions or five sessions a day that only last like 15 to 30 minutes, if I recall. And uh, one guy's oh. in the litter, and it's it's over. So it's like that really blows <clears throat> your guys' practice in pro FD. That that, <laughs> that kitty litter is treacherous, of course. But we have a <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's a tricky one for sure. So go for Pico. Yeah, I have a couple uh, super chat questions. I think the, we should get, take care of these one uh, from Matt Hill. He's mm. uh, asking. This I'm ordering. Really important. <clears throat> yeah, I'm ordering from <laughs> Outback Steak. Yeah, what's up, Matty? Yeah, there you go, Matt Hill. I'm ordering from Outback Steak. Should I get a Blooming Onion or the Kukubara Wings? Uh, just get the one that, uh, the Surf and Turf. That way you've got the, the best of both worlds. Surf and Turf? on the barbie, mate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're a walking stereotype, my friend. I feel like, Matt Hill, uh, the Blooming Onion... And the kookaburra wings are pretty good choices. And go. What I like to do is I will actually, you know, let the onion unfold and bloom, and then I will stuff the wings in between the bits, and then I'll take a fork and a knife and cut it, and and just kind of get a little bit of a, a wing, a kookaburra wing, and a, a, an onion bite in each in each uh, bite. Where do where do blooming onions naturally bloom in Australia? Is that something that you can like just walk? <laughs> and pick? I, I don't think it's something you just pick on the side of the road. Okay. Knowing Matty Hill though, he would buy the most expensive thing on the menu and the second most expensive thing on the menu, and then stuff the second most expensive thing with the most expensive thing, yeah. and then eat that. That's my that's my style. A um, couple more super chat just powers drift early on in the show. Just uh, give us a buck, thanks, man. Appreciate it. And uh, Adrian, uh, Adrian, Adrian again. Adrian C though. He says top five pro two guys. Carlson looks real good this year. Who are the top five pro two guys? And if you put yourself at number one, I'm gonna think very poorly of you, Josh. <laughs> oh hell no, not in that battleship. Um, so, yeah, Rob Carlson, awesome to see him uh, finally getting a clear run at it. That guy, I think in the last two years, hasn't made a top 16. Um, and then to see him throwing down in Orlando, throwing down in Atlanta, it's just like, hell yeah, absolutely hyped for that guy. Uh, so it was good to see him finally uh, getting a, a reliable rig under him and uh, showing what he can do for sure. Yep. So Rob's a, a good contender. Um <clears throat> Rome is definitely a good one. He's got, he's come from grassroots. He won two championships last year in grassroots uh, stuff out in California. And he's got a, a really reliable chassis. He was my pick for Orlando, actually, and he ended up putting it on the podium. So I was pumped to see him up there. He's been uh, off, he's not been on my radar before. What's, um, has he competed in Pro 2 previously, or is this his first year? No, this is his first year. Yeah. Interestingly, because uh, this is a Cal because he's a California guy, I was chatting to him at Atlanta, and I think he said that was the second time he'd ever driven in the rain. Damn, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, so he was just like, what is this drift juice falling from the sky? Yeah. And just had, uh, but I, I honestly didn't pick it when I saw him out for qualifying. I was like, holy shit, like Rome was, was on it. Um, but yeah, I think it was only his second or third time driving in the rain, which is pretty wild. And I mean, you uh, come from Australia don't have a lot of experience with that either, I imagine. My car in Australia, I've only driven in the wet once, but yeah. I've driven a bunch. I've driven a lot in Japan, so uh, I that's have true. hundreds of hours of uh, wet driving from Japan, and then obviously ice drifting with Asbo in Norway, and then early this year in Minnesota with the guys up there. Um, all of that helps a lot for sure. Yeah, so you do have experience in that. I'm sure that 
uh, played a role in your victory in Atlanta. Um, so we we talked about your first battle in Atlanta uh, against uh, Alec, and then you went up against Ola. How was uh, that battle with uh, Chucky the Supra? Uh, it was good. It was it was fun to drive against him because I know that he has a lot of the issues that I have with my car in that they're big and heavy. So uh, it was cool to go up against him. I've admired uh, Ola's driving for a long time. He had an amazing season last year and uh, did pretty good in 2017 as well. You went to so Nor you went to Norway with him, right? For the for the do some ice drifting. Uh, he went out with Fred last year. The year before, I didn't actually get to catch up oh, with okay. while I was out there. Yeah, so we didn't get to drive together in Norway, unfortunately. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was good going as Ola. I knew it was going to be a clean run. The guy knows how to drive. He's not going to do anything uh, wild to jeopardize anything in the lead. I knew it would be a, a good clean run. So there was no second thoughts about getting on door. And it was good to drive with someone that uh, is a very comparable chassis uh, to my own. So, yeah, it was a good run and, and fun to, to go up against him for sure. Grand touring car life. <laughs> what do you uh? What do you think Battle about the new Supra? What do you think about the new Supra? It's uh, it's growing on me, man. I, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of getting super jitters right now. It's, uh, there's still my, my complaints about it is still valid. Like I'm not a big fan of a lot of the body styling aspects, but a bunch of uh, the influencers and reviewers just went and drove them, and I had a chance to talk with uh, Matt Farah smoking tire at uh, our pre Lufka Kilt RS party. And uh, he's like, dude, it's one of the best cars I've ever driven. I'm like, God damn it. I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm having bad thoughts oh. about a new Supra now. <laughs> uh, I like the look of them with some of the rowdy body kit renders that are going around online. Yeah. Uh, I guess like any car that you can stand next to a new Ferrari 488 or a Lamborghini Aventador or a McLaren or whatever. And they just don't really do it for me because it's a, a stock car with stock boundaries and things like that. Right. Whereas throw like a really good kit on it some wheels whatever you can definitely tune them and make anything look sexy but for a, a car off the shelf i don't think there's really anything these days that i would go hell yeah that thing looks awesome mm -hmm. uh and to start fooling around with it with aftermarket stuff and definitely the ranges i've seen of the supra with some modifications uh, uh like i would consider getting one but one off the off the shelf doesn't really blow my hair back yeah I think if you just kind of fix a bit of the useless body styling on there and like actually plumb some of the fake plastic ducts and, and do some other minor things to it. But one of the things I liked uh, in uh, Engineering Explained, Jason Fenske's video, he was talking about how... Hello and the, welcome. Hello and welcome to the rest of this podcast. Uh, he, <laughs> they were saying how the, the the engineers at Toyota like made the, the ECU map... So it definitely like dumps fuel on D cell, so it automatically uh, pops and burbles and backfires, which I think is pretty cool. It's like, oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, they're like they they it's inefficient and uh, dirty and wasting fuel, but they know the the fuck boys that like driving those cars like me <laughs> are like, really pumped. Like I get so overjoyed when I'm driving my Subaru and like I fucking am D and off the freeway and it just lets out a huge backfire and it just makes me so happy. Especially when I'm like uh, deselling next to a Prius or something, and I can visibly <laughs> see them get concerned. <laughs> so you uh, you bested Ola, Ola, and then you went against the young gun Brandon, who uh, has been a buzz in the drifting world because he's just a babe. We, we've uh, we, we've won he him just on the turned show, he but... just turned 15 two weeks ago. Oh, congratulations! He's almost he's almost old enough to party. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Wait, is... Is he 15 or is his sister he was, 15? He turned they're 15. Both, they're both like 14, 15. No, uh, Amanda, she's uh, uh, 17, I believe, 16, oh, 17. She, and, I, uh, I thought they were the yeah. same age. And uh, Brandon just turned 15 two weeks ago. <laughs> That's insane. I thought, just turned, I thought that he just turned 14. I thought they were 14 and 16. Okay. Uh, Pop, uh -huh. you get corrected, yeah. dog. No, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, uh, there was a post and everything. Congratulations, Brandon. You can turn 15. He's made it in Mexico. In agents. Mexico, that's old enough to party. So, all right, we have to take him for end of season. Yep, some, uh, some, so yeah, went up against you in top four. Uh, yeah, it was a clean run. I got to throw down a whole bunch of laps with him in Orlando, uh, which was great. It was a uh, clean run runs and it was 
not a whole bunch to say about that. I think it'll be really interesting to see uh, where he goes in the future. I know that they've got uh, Michael Esser helping them out a bunch this year as a driver coach, and he's uh, crewing with them as well. So I think definitely the fact that he's 15 years old and has a, a former world champion on his team uh, helping out with car setups and driving advice and things like that, the sky's the limit, man. Holy heck. Uh, who's, who's the uh, teammate or team member you're talking about? Michael Essa. Oh, I didn't know Mike was on his team. That's cool. Yeah, so uh, Mike's transporting his car this year with those guys, and Brandon's car is identical to uh, Michael S's in terms of setup, like suspension and, and all ah, that jazz. That's interesting. Got a, yeah, so they've got a whatever the latest model BMW uh, body kit is on um, Brandon's car, but mm -hmm. yeah, other than that, my understanding is from Michael Essa is that the car is identical to his car at BMW. I just uh, pulled up the battle right now. It's, I wish there was a better way to... I feel like in the past years on F NFD, they would uh, put like individual battles on YouTube, but now I have to like scrub through um, and just try to find your battle. It looks like you were in the dry then. I forget, was there... Was there wet battles during top 32? Or you guys, you guys are mostly dry, weren't you? Uh, top 16 was all dry. Oh, top 16, excuse me. Um, yeah, and it was only after we got off the podium that it, uh, the heavens absolutely opened about 1 a.m. just as we got off the podium and started to pack up. Yeah, <laughs> we had to get out of there pretty quick. Um, someone was talking about this actually. I forget where, but um, uh, drone god Johnny Jonathan, first person view, was out there. Yeah. Does it ever? Does it ever surprise you just like when you're cruising and there's fucking drones just like in your face? Because like as you come around the keyhole, you see him like do a 360, which is one of the only ways to scrub speed on those things quickly. So it's like he does a 360, I think, to kind of scrub speed, but also because it looks awesome. Like, does it ever like make you jump when you're just driving and all of a sudden this quadcopter is in your windshield? Yeah, someone asked me that the other day. To be honest, like you have more pressing issues at hand, like <laughs> yeah. flying through that car in front of you and yeah. like, not mustanging it off into the audience. So it might be a super fast like blip that goes past you and subconsciously register it. But for me, at least, like I yeah. focus the task at hand. And like, I've had, yeah, like I've had drones hit my car before in Japan. I had one like coming through the passenger window and hit me. But that might have awesome. been Johnny's drone, I can't remember. <laughs> but like I've, I've been hit by them before and like it just you you focus on the task at hand. Like yeah. Uh, you, yeah. It's For not me, like it's, it's not an you, issue. Most drivers I think they get so dialed that it's like that's why when like as a lead driver you get run over, like you still keep going most of the time. It's like you're you're kind of in the zone and you don't just like like see someone in the audience like, Hey, there's there's my friend Steve. <laughs> like you <laughs> you don't recognize things outside of the uh outside of what's directly in front of you. Yeah, but the I... The crazy I, thing with Road Atlanta, like the only thing that I have ever noticed from the outside is on a busy night there when the audience is really rowdy, you can't actually hear them over the cars. Oh, which really? Is just, nice. Which is just absurd because the cars <laughs> are so loud. You've got a couple of thousand horsepower there going at full noise and you can hear the crowd over the cars. And that's the only track I've ever experienced that at, which is just insanity. Um... I was gonna. I, I want to talk to you about Pro One stuff after we talk about your Pro, your Pro Two win and all that. But one thing that was it, Derp. <laughs> I mentioned it in the first place but about uh, <clears throat> Travis Reader's car, um, the the electric car, and how it's potentially dangerous in that the chase driver can't hear, uh, like throttle cues. You can't hear um, yep. acceleration and deceleration. What are your opinions on that? Uh, Potentially going up against uh, Travis uh, when you inevitably go to Pro One, or when someone inevitably brings an electric car to Pro Two. Yeah, it's interesting. It's something that I hadn't considered until I'd seen that on Dirt Bike. And then I, like, I saw a couple of videos that he's posted of, uh, like, uh, Osbo was one from the weekend where he spun behind him, and it's really interesting. And and then when I sat down and thought about it some more, like, I can definitely see his point because. Uh, like you do listen for that oral cue, and if it's not there, you don't know what that lead car is doing. And obviously, the car makes noise before that traction gets put to the ground, so you have a, a half a second or a second uh, like lead on the car revving up before it puts the power to the ground. So yeah, I think it, that could be an interesting one, and, and definitely one that I hadn't considered before he raised it. 
And yeah, upon reflection, I think that could definitely be a tricky thing to chose. And not just hear it. I mean, I imagine you can feel it too as a chase driver, like being directly behind the lead driver with a big engine or just, you know, a loud exhaust. Like you can feel it in your chest, like when that motor is thumping. But yep, you, uh, absolutely. You, don't, you don't get that experience. I'm curious. I didn't, I didn't consider that aspect of uh, electric cars <clears throat> and FD until now. And I wonder. I wonder how that will affect the future of it. And it was definitely cool to see uh, the Napoleon and Travis uh, reader get out there and get the, the runs down the track. It, that being said, it doesn't look like it's nearly close to being competitive yet. But, you know, the, it's a new car. Um, we've yet to really see a competitive uh, Camaro yet. Um, I'm trying to remember, Pocket. You probably know better than I, O'Brien, mm -hmm. as well. Like, was... Um, Grunwald was in uh, Camaro, right? Or was that? Um, That's correct. Macquarie, yeah. Conrad was he, and Tyler, yeah. Did he? Did they? Did he and, ever uh, do that well? <clears throat> yeah, I mean Tyler Macquarie made a few finals at Irwindale. Uh, yeah, Conrad yeah. had had some podiums as well. He was throwing okay, some so really uh, crazy backwards entries. He was yeah. kind of known for that at Atlanta. In Atlanta, that was that was Conrad's mm -hmm. ground right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the car did have a history and does have a history of, of doing okay. Even guess, Turk I, drove a Camaro at some point. Yeah, I think <laughs> even right Essa now. did, remember? Yeah, well, yeah. well, nobody we remembers that one. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about Essa's Camaro. That's but, the one. <laughs> but, I mean, it definitely has a, an ability to to do well, and I forgot about those uh, those accolades for it. So, yeah, I'm just curious to see what happens when they can start putting down runs and testing it. So I don't want to judge them yet because it's a totally new I mean, platform. And, and if everything's you, new about if it, you but. think about it, if you think about it, Josh's uh, Ute, it's kind of like a bigger Camaro. I mean, it's very similar drivetrain, pretty much, just longer wheelbase and probably heavier, right? Yep. <laughs> is one thing I think I've never asked you about your Ute is your rear suspension geometry helped or hurt by its uh, Uteness? Uh, I mean, it's the same as the Pontiac G8. They don't have great suspension travel in the rear because of uh, how short the shock is. So BC and us had to like get a custom-made shock so that the body would be shorter with the throw so we actually got something resembling a normal amount of travel out of it. But even then, uh, like if we could extend that shock or have something like a, an S-chassis-style shock in there where they get like eight inches of wheel travel and things like that, right. I mean that'd be that'd be amazing, but unfortunately we're not allowed to modify any of that, so um, we have to play the hand that we're dealt. Do you have um, uh, external reservoir uh, shocks in the rear? Yeah, we do. Okay, so I mean, that's, I guess that helps uh, with a shorter travel on the shock, like. It does, yeah, but unfortunately, uh, the overall length of the shock is so short on those that even with a an external reservoir, it's still not ideal, but it's it's in the realm of like we we make it work. It'd be great if it was longer for sure, yeah. but um, like it is what it is, and we're allowed to modify it. So uh, that, that was one of the that was one of the things that stuck with me from uh, talking to uh, Pro Two best friend. Sorry, Josh uh, Riley. <laughs> in that uh, Riley Sexsmith was saying that um, that the Subarus are, are kind of not competitive because of that, is as they just have such a short. Uh, I might be butchering butchering this as Paco says, <laughs> but from what I recall, he was just saying that the short uh, shock uh, assembly that you you are not allowed to modify in the rear it kind okay. of limits that car. But I mean that's. That's, that, is that, that is one of the problems that the, the FRS and BRC chassis have. They have very short rear uh, coilovers. Short yeah. I mean, if you remember uh, when we were talking to Matt Field about his China, uh, for, uh, it was a Formula Drift China yeah. or D1 mm -hmm. China? China? I think the, uh, D1 China. Is, yeah. They allow you to modify the strut tower. So they literally just made a hole and threw a, a strut mm -hmm. through the floor. So you had like a new, like, you know, in order to get a longer. A longer shock and that seems to fix everything so i mean yeah, I, they don't seem to have a ton of rules out there which is interesting i remember talking to forsberg about it a little bit as he gets uh, deeper into the china and, and the china series and he was just saying oh, like yeah this year we're just going to build the most insane corvette you've ever seen because uh because there's no rules, no, no rules. <laughs> you can do whatever you want <laughs> yeah because we can yeah, that'll be so cool like if you can imagine the back of my ute if we were to cut a six inch wide hole in there and then just run a trophy truck style setup 
just like push forward the uh, the radium engineering fuel cell and the, the Mishimoto cooler and just have an enormous BC racing uh, like trophy truck through and, there. Like, sticking up so over rad. the bed. Yeah, I wonder so where they... Have, have it the same height as the cab. The only wonder... problem is with the back of those, even, even though we have such limited travel at the moment, uh, the exhaust and everything just hits the ground so easily. Coming off the bank at Orlando this year, we actually tore the exhaust off the car. Um, and, and it's already ovaled as well as it is. It's not like we're running a really low exhaust. It's tucked up as high as it will possibly go uh, up into the subframe. And just from doing that, it actually ovaled the exhaust as well. Uh, just, from, just from bottoming out. It's, it's not the best setup for sure, but we're allowed to modify it. So just put an extra layer of welds on it and send it. I wonder where like the, the cliff of diminishing returns is for drift um, travel. Like where what's the maximum you want before it starts getting not effective? Like would everyone add Yeah, would everyone add length to their to their shocks if they could? I don't know. I'm not a suspension engineer. <laughs> I can't so, even drive a straight car a car in a straight line, you're asking me one go. <laughs> By the way, right. um, Brandon Sorensen just logged in on Facebook. Is there anything you want to tell to the junk gun? What's a junk gun? A junk gun. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Brandon Sorensen? We we're just talking about you, man. And Hello. we're just happy thanks birthday. For, thanks for the runs in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> and Elijah. And happy birthday. Um, right. So no, well, I, after I know that oh. you, you're fucking Aussie. You tell dirty jokes. I need you to clean it up now that Brandon's here. <laughs> Can you do that for me, Josh? What, PG-13? PG-15. Oh, PG-15. Josh, someone PG, asked him, PG-15. Can, uh, someone, can someone ask him to clear it up how old he is? Because we had rate, ages range from 15 Brandon, to 15. It's too just, know. just say old enough to party, dude. You don't need to explain yourself. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Josh, tell us about your final battle so we can wrap up the Pro 2. Uh, so final battle was uh, with Meyer, Kenrick. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Kenrick yeah, Lamar. Yeah. Meyer. <laughs> Lamar. Yeah, so he was actually pitted next to us as well. Um, I think he said that he had blown a radiator hose in a previous battle, and they didn't have time, or they no. Sorry, he said that they didn't manage to get it to bleed properly, so the car was just overheating like crazy. We got sent out for his first run. And on that transition, the step, my, my top 16, we had it pretty down. So we figured out how to get the car or get the ute up the hill as fast as possible. But then when I was going up the hill, I was like, holy shit, this guy is slow. And <laughs> just, hit him, it was, didn't you? It was, yeah, it was going slower, going slower, going slower. And I was just like on the foot brake, on the handbrake, like doing everything I could to keep the car sideways. And then by the time we got to outside zone two at the top of the keyhole in front of the crowd, like he'd pretty much parked that thing because it just had no gusto left. Yep. And yeah, I just gave him a little on the hiney. Yeah. And uh, he kept on going and I uh, straightened because of it. And the judges saw how much he'd slowed going up the hill. Uh, and then when we, uh, sorry, and I had db a tire in that contact as well. So we got mm -hmm. back up there, queued up for our second run. And the judges gave him the fault. So I had the opportunity to go and check the car and fit the tires, and uh, his engine had just completely seized mm, uh, coming across the finish line anyway. So even though his car was toasted on the first run and he would have been able to make the second run, um, yeah, it was all over from there. Yeah, it was looks like uh -huh. your real quick, just like your you. Uh, it looks like it just didn't really mind uh, the the battle damage. <laughs> like it just kind of punted him. A little S14 here. Like it doesn't really uh, have a lot of sheet metal compared to the U. The U is a tank. Well, the thing was that I still managed to break a rear left tail light, and uh -huh. I only sent over. I sent over three pairs of those for the, the whole year. <laughs> I lost one at Orlando running a wall. And at Road Atlanta, like you would never expect to lose a tail light at Road Atlanta because there's nothing to hit other than another car, which I managed to do. And so, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're, so we're now down two left tail lights uh, so far the season. I've still got <laughs> three right ones, and I've got one left one left. So if anyone's coming from Australia yeah. this year, that I can uh, ship you some tail lights to, to fly over with for me, that'd be awesome. Or you can just stuff a blooming onion in there and call it a day. <laughs> If you can get K-Dog Wells to sign off on that for me, I'm down. 
Yeah, that, I love that, your. Oh, sorry, Paco. Sorry, sorry, yeah, was saying, like, it was uh, very unfortunate for Kendrick Meyer because he qualified first. Yeah. And he was doing great. And I mean, I remember when, looking at the final race, he didn't even do a burnout before before Josh. I was like, oh, it looks like something's wrong. And it definitely. Maybe it was just the confidence. Yeah. I mean, he still sent it, you know, like, I mean, mad props to him because uh, he's a rookie and he, you know, he, he, I, I guess he didn't qualify in Orlando and then in Atlanta, yeah. he, or, or, or he didn't, I'm not sure, but, you know, he came up swinging second well, he, round. He beat Trenton, who we just spoke to on the podcast, who was looking incredibly strong and who won Orlando with the yeah. uh, perfect round for first place qualifying. He beat him in the top round and Trenton, um, <coughs> Yeah, Trenton was having mechanical issues. Oh, was he? Well. Yeah. And then uh, he beat our good buddy Andy Haley, and then he beat uh, Denton, and then you know came up against you, and and that's it's just a really cool story in that you know it's not like you qualified fifteenth because I don't think I think you're better than the fifteenth best driver in Pro Two, but yeah. it's like the first qualifier versus one of the lowest qualifiers, and the lowest qualifier wins. It's it's an interesting and fun story. Pro Two is very exciting these days. Yeah, and definitely like when you throw weather into the mix as well, it's it's rowdy. Like Trent Beecham, who, as you say, got the perfect round uh, at Orlando with a first place qualifier and finished first. When he uh, got to Atlanta, he like only just scraped through by a single point into the top sixteen. So when you start to get wet weather and drifting, it's it's anybody's game really. So the perfect driver from the previous round only qualified at Atlanta uh, with a point. And I, and I feel that that's because the first half of uh, qualifying got a dry track and obviously Trent going last would have had some pretty difficult um, track conditions on his hands. Yeah. Well, you're um, you're only three points behind Trent, who's uh, right now still sitting, <clears throat> sitting as points leader. And then Kenrick Meyer behind you with 41 points behind. So... Um, there's two, only four rounds, so it's yeah, like you, two more rounds. You, you still, do well, you and do well in two if of I'm, them, and and someone else doesn't do as well in two of them. You know, if I'm like if I'm not mistaken, um, Josh, you you got your license, your pro license last year, didn't you? Uh, uh, yeah, the year before, in fact. Okay, yeah, but you just decided to just take another round on on pro two. Do you think do you think you're ready for pro, or it's still? Um. There's a lot of factors that go into that. It's it's interesting how it works after like seeing it on the live stream from overseas and being here in the US and seeing how it works as a business and what's involved in doing that. Uh, like it's not only the the car aspect, it's then the driving and then it's the finance, the business that go into that as well. Like I say all the time to guys that ask me, it's not just a case of driving because really we only drive for a few minutes every other month. It's the actual seat time itself isn't much. It's really a, like drifting is a triathlon, which is a mixture of being able to drive the car, working out the, the business and the finance and the logistics of it. And then uh, like actually like the, the marketing side of it as well. So I, I don't think that I have the perfect combination yet. And so it's not worth it for me. And I'm still trying to get the business case to stack up to go and run pro one because my ute won't be competitive for that i i know that and our cost to switch to a new chassis won't be that bad now to spend so much time here we're like very fortunate with the the sponsors that we have so it wouldn't be crazy money to to switch to a new chassis but then it's a case of you're competing against some very well funded teams that have been here for more than a decade and a half are you going to actually rock up and be competitive with those guys or are you better off doing pro two and then going off and doing all the media things that you do outside of that? But for me, I do the ice drifting. We do like a a whole range of things. I'm building the twin supercharged V12 LS at the moment and things like that. So that we still have the, the media reach that our sponsors need to give us the funding we need to run the program because what you kind of have to understand, and, and I'm sure that like guys back home and people that, that aren't in the, the industry really truly appreciate, is that if you're a top, if you're a bottom tier Pro One driver, like from 17 to 32, and you're not even making the main event, then realistically your sponsors are getting three minutes of air time on a weekend. Yeah. Like, it, well, sorry, three minutes of you, you get three minutes of seat time on a weekend, versus if you go and do Pro Two and, and do okay, then you get more seat time. 
but also you don't have the equipment of those extra four rounds per year. Uh, so you, you can go off and do things like build twin supercharged V12 LSs and go ice drifting and have hundreds of millions of views doing all that stuff. And that's what pays the bills. Yeah. So I think until until you have a really good budget and your driving's good, your team's good, your, your, your chassis is good, everything's really buttoned down and you know that you're going to rock up and you've got a really good chance of running uh, in the top 16 and getting through to the main event at least in six or six out of the eight rounds, then it's kind of what I was saying earlier on about the Pro 2 guys that are showing up this year and not qualifying for the main event. Those guys might only be getting three runs for the weekend, which is 60 seconds of of actual drifting mm -hmm. and then the, the practice and qualifying and then they're going home. At least in Pro 1, you get probably double the amount of practice, but then you've still got uh, uh, like your, your two qualifying runs and then a little bit more practice before the main event. So maybe you get four or five minutes of seat time for a weekend in Pro 1 if you're not in the top 16. That was a really long-winded answer, but I'm also really <laughs> no, passionate about this. I mean, it's, it's, I'm yeah, sure it's, it's, it's heavily... Good on your mind so um well, yeah for me that, that's that's why like i can't get the business case to stack up at the moment because i don't have what i feel is the the perfect combination of those three really key areas so for me i'm better off doing what i'm doing building wild twin supercharged drift cars going ice drifting doing all this other stuff that we're doing because that pays the bills not busting ass to go and run <laughs> four minutes of seat time in fd and not be in the top 16. Right. When you what up? Uh, oh, so when you talk about a new chassis and all that, would you still consider a youth, just a newer youth, or would you consider moving to something else? Uh, no. So there is no such thing as a, a newer youth. Holden stopped making those two years ago. No. Uh, I think the, uh, or, or at least so, like a new one, like it's in a fresh chassis. Uh, it would still have the same inherent issues in that it's mm -hmm. uh, too long wheelbase, okay. and too heavy. Um, the, the reason uh, I, uh -huh. I, I really want to run a I really want to run a, a C6 Corvette. I've been a big fan of those for a while. Dirk Stratton had one the year that I was over here for Pro Two, and now obviously Matt Field throwing down his 99s at um, Long Beach and things like that. I, I'd really love to run a, a Corvette for sure. It's just a case of um, they're bringing all that yeah. together. But how much how much do you think uh, your personal image uh, is related with uh, youth now? Like, I mean, because I, th I think it's a car that it's so attractive just for being so different and it's cool and and it's so Australian. And I mean, it just doesn't get more Australian than that. And how much I mean, and you, you, you even just you got your car uh, featured on Forza 7 and Forza Horizon and like it just seems like there's like there's so much image attached to you and the youth, which seems like like a very cool thing. Like, you know, like how much you think it really, it really, um, how do you say? Uh, like, how much of you is really attached to that the, to the image of the car and, and the youth? Man, I love that thing more than anyone. Uh, um, but it's, it depends. Like, is it? winning races that pays the bills or is it uh like being a like a midfield driver yeah. in a unique chassis well, but that's and that's something that i and that's something that i struggle to answer as well because there's a lot of drivers that are very successful that yeah. are on the podium um but like i would definitely keep that car have as a uh, as a demo car and go and do all the the cool stuff that yeah. i wanted to do with that for sure but in terms of it being a, a podium contender pro one car uh it's not and I mean, that kind of goes back to as well. The reason that we initially built that chassis and sent it over here was because Formula Drift had a different set of tire rules. And that's what really caught us out with that. Yeah. Because it took, us a, it took us a year to build it and then ship it to the US. And then eight weeks before the 2017 season started, Formula Drift changed the rules and brought in the, the 255 um, like mandated tire, yeah. which I wholeheartedly agree with. Like, I, I think it's a great thing that they've done that because it then means that like rolling in and just like having a, a huge tire budget, running enormous tires, uh, uh, stops guys from running away with the championship just because they've got more money. But for us, uh, we came over here expecting that tire rule to be in place when we got here. And then after a year of like building and developing that chassis and sending it over here to find that out eight weeks before the season started, 
made it really difficult. And, and like we've now had to like stick with that decision because we spent all that like time and money on building that. So even though it's not the ideal chassis these days to compete in Pro 2, it's still 600 pounds too heavy and the, the tire is really small we have to run. Uh, I mean, we still got on the podium, which is which is amazing, yeah. but it's hard work for sure. Do you did you notice any any bump or any uh, like big gains on your program and your ease of access to sponsors and stuff like that uh, after your car was featured in Forza? By the way, um, yes and no. Like there were a couple of sponsors that were like definitely super hyped on it. I think just in general, like it gives you that certain level of uh, legitimacy in terms of like your car is like in the, yeah. the most played automotive video game in the world. Like that's that's rad for sure. Yeah. And, uh, like definitely people recognize it and me because of it for sure. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that anyone has specifically like sought out my phone number or whatever solely because I've seen it in the game, but definitely it like it helps a hundred percent and it um like brings more attention to the program and it's like look we're going out here like doing all these things we like we say what we do and like here it is in the industry getting recognized by the grades nice yeah definitely must pump up your active sponsors and the ones who are on the car in the game that everyone has seen it like definitely uh expands greatly your viewership considering you know i don't know the numbers for fd pro 2 uh watches but <laughs> you know to see you for one minute on the screen even if you you know win the event with your granted you went like four one more times throughout the, the weekend or three one more times but it's like the fact that someone can literally stare at the logo on the back of your car for hours and hours and hours and obviously advertising yeah. is much deeper than just looking at a logo on a bumper but i mean yeah. it's, it doesn't hurt you say because yeah, it was it was pretty big for us like with with 2f like seeing Uh, two cars with our sticker on it and um, <laughs> even even uh, Andy Hadley had like one of my old stickers from the from the drift van on his car and he still made it to the game like that was just like just plain cool but yeah. I don't know I mean like in, in my opinion like I mean you're so you, you right now you have a Duralast uh, which mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken Duralast is an AutoZone brand I mean all my all my batteries are Duralast by the way for all my 12 <laughs> all my all my all my 12 vehicles And um, oh yeah, awesome! And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that is one of the ITW companies. Is that is that correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so Duralast is owned by AutoZone. Um, to try and explain it for the guys in Australia who don't know what AutoZone is, it's <laughs> the well, I'm going to have it back home. So the equivalent <laughs> of AutoZone would be uh, a company called Super Cheap Auto, which in America would make it sound as though AutoZone is cheap, but yeah, like it's not. It's a, yeah, but, it, but, it, but it's not just like the equivalent in Australia, for some reason they're called super cheap. Their stuff isn't super cheap. It's yeah. like it's a quality product, but that's what the name of the chain is. So in Australia, the equivalent would be like super cheap auto. Um, in the US, they employ 45,000 staff They're listed in the, uh, the top 200 companies in the US. And they have the crazy, I think like 5,000 stores around the US. So it, it, got, sometimes it feels like chrome windshield wipers, if that's what you need. <laughs> if you need LED um, underglow, uh, tire, yeah. If you need underglow, or if you need LED, I was gonna say um, I don't know, valve, yeah. valve, valve stem. I, I've never used one, <laughs> but what do you call that those things that cap off your that tires? Uh, you know, you can get like valve fake chrome cap. trim, <laughs> but honestly, it's, it's it's yeah, it's where you go to get your oils. No, but they, 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 they cater for all markets. Yeah. Hot boys and, and mums and dads and uh, yeah, performance guys alike. Mm. We're like I bought a I bought a nitrous system from them this week, so like they can special <laughs> or anything. That's yeah, I'm, I'm getting a nitrous system for my three PZ. <laughs> so nice. Like we run yeah, so we run uh, like Duralast uh, brake calipers, Duralast uh, coil packs and things like that, right through to uh, um, Like NX Nitro systems come through AutoZone as well, so yeah, that's crazy. Like, oh, so you're actually using they, their they products. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Like we, uh, the 350Zs that we took ice drifting were were full of Duralast parts, from the batteries to the the windshield wipers to now Nitro systems. So hmm. uh, yeah, we do use a bunch of this stuff. And it goes on the podium. So yeah, yeah. I wonder. Bye. Bye. 
I wonder. I always see like weird when I when I go up to the counter. Sorry, pocket real quick. When I go up to yeah. the counter, like when I buy an oil and a filter, and I see like they sell engines for this car and this car. It's like it's so weird to think like AutoZone would do like an engine delivery or like you just like walk up to the counter and be like, all right, I'm here for my engine. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then they like the the aloof employee like goes in the back and like oh uh, here you go. Uh, then, no, like, no they, they have to ask uh, make and model. Yeah. Hol <laughs> Holden Ute. Uh, what is that, sir? Yeah, that, that is true because they do ask for make and model. So it's like when you're buying LS parts for your U, you have to be like, it's, don't worry about it, man. The, the car is not in the system. Just put it in Corvette. We'll be okay. <laughs> I wonder. Yeah, for us, it's Pontiac G8 and the Chevy SS. There you go. Uh, oh, that's right. Most, yeah. Same. The, the most common crossovers and some are from a Camaro as well. Mm. So I wonder if, if uh, Carolina uh, Pillar Shake, she's, uh, she's sponsored by, by Circle K. So I wonder if she gets all the Polar Pops and. And uh, all the snacks, you know, fresh hot dogs, yeah. the <laughs> all the rolling rolling grill items. I've now, I don't think I've ever eaten a roller dog. From what? A, from a? No, that's not true. I definitely have from like a Sonic. Sonic is different though. That's like fancy. Oh. Ooh, 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 fancy <laughs> <laughs> Sonic. So Josh, I've did never you? Eaten Sonic, but the guys were talking about it the other day. Bob was oh, like, sorry, I wasn't talking about Sonic. I was talking about QT. They have similar signage for some reason. QT, well, excuse me. Oh, That's what I meant. Well, yeah. She's sponsored by Circle K, but. Yeah. I yeah. meant QT. And QT with a crushed ice. Oof. 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 I, I eat rolling I, rolling grill items all the time. I think the, the, I the pep, uh, uh, was it the jalapeno, pepper cheese, taquito, and the steak and cheese? Hot dogs, too. Same. The hot dogs. Mm. Corey, when, Corey, when Corey was living with me, we used to go like middle of the night. Fact, let's, go to, let's go to a quick trip. We'll grab like three hot dogs each, just top them with everything. $3. That yeah, that's good times. <laughs> so, so, Josh, did you stick around for Pro One? Yeah, absolutely. You watch the whole ordeal unfold, the wet, wet Form one. Formula Mud. Yeah. To be honest, I think it was awesome because it kind yeah, of was... rained. Then once Top 16 started, uh, there was only really like one or two very brief showers that came through. And outside of that, it was great spectating. Like Everyone just ran under the big tents for like a minute or two while the, the rain came through. And then after that, it was completely fine. Other than not being there... Uh, which I absolutely hated <laughs> still, but I, uh, I did love watching what I could watch after the fact. Uh, it was just, it was just really insane looking with between the, uh, the full wet driving into seeing just absolute monsters. Like, of course the, uh, the warehouse boys just were crazy in the rain because that's how they drive all the time in Poland and Ireland. <laughs> Excuse me. And, and Frederick as well. Like and being the, the yeah. Euro boy. Yeah. Freddie was crazy. Um, the, the craziest, in my opinion, was uh, Odie, who we just talked to. We've always known that Odie is a highly skilled, uh, adverse condition driver. But Odie and who was that battle? That was the, the, my favorite battle of the weekend. It was Odie and I'm looking at the uh, I think it was Odie and uh, James Dean or Odie and Forrest. I don't recall, but already announced but i don't know they're all crazy but it's just like these guys were driving in the rain and minus a tire smoke like this <laughs> i know it was slower of course but the speeds were still very fast and the proximity to each other and they're all hitting their zones like it was insane to see pounding rain and, and these guys i find going it, i honestly find it more impressive when they're door to door in rain and it's all like know. you know josh yeah absolutely <laughs> uh like as you said like they're within a a foot of each other at any given moment, which is outstanding. Um, yeah, and I think that just kind of further highlights my point earlier on of if you make the step up to Pro One, like you got to bring your shit because <laughs> otherwise you get. That's... Otherwise, well, the thing is, like you have another month of your life with like the travel and the, the pit setups and everything else, and you're going there. And if you aren't on your game and you're not getting the top sixteen. You're going to get four minutes of seat time for the weekend, and then you're going to be driving back to wherever you came from. Versus if you hang back in Pro 2, go drive your local events where you get 10 hours of seat time over the course of a weekend at Lone Star Drift or whatever. Like, hang back in Pro 2, get the team together, get your driving together, and then roll into Pro 1 when like you've got that down pat. Because if you jump into Pro 1 too early, you're going to go up against those guys and just have a bad time all the time. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, speaking of, of Pat, uh, Paul Volichkov, uh, fan of a uh, friend of the show, he just mentioned in chat, uh, Pat Gooden top eight was a highlight for me. Oh, I think we can all say that seeing Pat Gooden in top eight was incredible. And his uh, interview with Lorette was one of the most heartwarming things. Yeah. He was, he was so goddamn happy. And uh, to, to know that he, I mean, we've talked to him off the show and of course on the show, it's like, he really wanted to know that he doesn't suck. And and for him, and, and we had like some heartfelt moments. I forget if this was on show or off show, but like he was saying how when he drove off in uh, Irwindale uh, before he came back, he's like, he's like, I may never drift pro drifting again. And this is the saddest thing in the world for me. And thanks to Matt Field and, and other sponsors, like he was able to get back in the game this year. And now that he's got a capable car, like he's shown that he can actually be a goddamn good driver. And it's, it's so it was so exciting to see Pat do really well. Um, I wish he would have gone further. I thought I thought he could have, but uh, who was who was his last battle? It was uh, he lost to Essa, and Essa was on fire. So yeah, uh, but I think he almost beat Essa from what I remember. It was it was uh, it was just very even, like yeah, you know, it was definitely it was a it was a very interesting round. I mean, ju- the photos of the cars at the end all covered in mud, like that, oh, that pretty was much the best spoke. part too. <laughs> Is when that when photo of you know, Turk's car was my favorite. I that know. thing was just destroyed. It's so good. It was so and cool. Like, on, like, the top, on the topic of like, I, I really feel for like for Turk because rebuilding that car between Long Beach and Orlando, I'm sure was no joke. From yeah, uh, like the guys I know were out right there helping him out. Like those guys were thrashing. So for him to put that thing on the podium at Atlanta was phenomenal. I and the same with Pat. Just... Like yeah. I remember seeing Pat two years ago. He was at uh, Orlando. And like he was literally emptying the trash cans, and then to see him back and like throwing down Mad Dog Runs Orlando, I was just like, "Heck yeah, Pat!" Like that was freaking rad. Well, he's emptying so the trash those, can those because things... he was he was looking for lunch. So don't. <laughs> I mean, dude, that's a struggle. Like people think we joke when we say that we eat cat food and two hundred noodles, but like, we're <laughs> yeah. welcome to pro drifting, homie. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna get to Turk next, and that uh, that's like. I get tear up a little bit thinking about my boy. Um, <laughs> I had, you know, I, I, I work uh, next to Turk all the time at race service, and, uh, and and I saw the immediate, you know, of course I saw the crash in Long Beach. I saw the immediate afterwards of like the team being like, well, shit, our cars written off. What do we do? You know, um, cut up the uh, the the chassis, the broken FD chassis. That was the oldest chassis in drifting. Jared, by the way, was having a really hard time explaining that <laughs> on the, in Atlanta. I don't know what was going on with Jared's talking, but uh, he was trying to explain that Ryan Turk's FD uh, GT86 FRS that was totaled <laughs> was the not the oldest car in the, FD, The Jared. longest surviving. Yes, it, it had the most years of competition on it. No, like, it's not actually, any... I was thinking of the other week because... Like that car's been around for a while since yeah. the 86 debut, right? It's the debut of the 86 is that car, and it's been in so many years. accidents. And he said, he said by the end of it, it was so loose and the seams were coming apart um, that he, so then he ripped up the the street car as they called it, um, but it was still a 600 horsepower 2J that you know we saw at Grid Life and all that. Um, and then they put all the parts in there, and and of course it took uh, it took the, the team. A whole, a, you know, a whole, it was a whole week, but it was 24 hours. Like they were working on it nonstop at, uh, excuse me, at RS and uh, Forsberg's garage, and and it was insane. And then on top of all that, though, like I knew that Turk was injured um, after the fact. Like he, he was not all there immediately at the event. Like he was definitely hard concussed. And then um, I got to so hang out with him. Drifter. Yeah, <laughs> but then I got to hang out with him uh, the day before. Uh, he went to to Atlanta, and and he was still fragile, for lack of a better term. Like, I feel weird talking about it because because I, I I you would think a normal person wouldn't want to share that condition, but I know he shared it with Lorette on uh, on the uh, the, the talks that she does with drivers. But he was not doing well. Like he was he was not a hundred percent Turk, and he, and his head was fuzzy, and like he would get tired. And like this has really affected him, and oh, wow. and I'm sure getting back on the podium uh, has really helped at least the motivation to improve. Because like head head trauma is no fucking joke, man. And I'm so happy that all the drivers have Hans devices now. Because if he did that accident without a Hans device, um, he would have been in the shit. And but just the fact that <laughs> I talked to him when I, he came into uh, he came into the office, I think yesterday, and 
and you know congratulate him and all that and i was like how how were you doing during that whole thing he's like i was laying down in the van in between every round just like trying to close my eyes and like get rid of the fuzz so he was still <laughs> struggling and the fact that he was able to struggle through all of that with a fresh ish car and and all that is just so cool for ryan and he, i thought for a second he almost had osbo but osbo just this car is too fast man <laughs> papa, <laughs> papa and osbo. yeah yeah osbo him. but i actually think we're going to talk to the turk uh, very soon maybe next week so We'll get all that from him. I don't want to put any more words in his mouth than he has, but I'm sure he'll want to talk about all that because it is no joke. Yeah, it's, it was definitely a cool event to watch despite the weather. The, 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 definitely the best bad weather event I've ever seen. Absolutely. As you said, like everyone stepped up the game. The Pro 1 guys are just insane. Rain, hail, or shine. Just immediately on door, no hesitation. It's just uh, uh, like every run is like watching a replay of the previous one. It's just initiate on door on door on door across the finish line okay next <laughs> it's just yeah. getting out yeah. of control and, that, and that's that's the scary part about the pro one stuff it's like uh do you, i mean you kind of mentioned it already but like you don't think that just due to the the restrictions and rule booking you can ever turn the ute into a pro one competitor <sighs> with the like with the size tire on it that we intended it would definitely be a lot closer, but I think just the wheelbase will always be its shortcoming. And I hear a lot of like season pro one guys talking about the ideal wheelbase and things like that. And like we're a foot and a half to two feet longer <laughs> than that. So it's just absurd. I'm curious uh, if like, you're where you stand up against like the Viper and the Ferrari, um, Carney you, and uh, you could, Federico's you could car. Park you could park both of those in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those like are if, I brake check, if I brake check them and like they land in the back, we could have the perfect tandem and they'd still fit. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, believe me, like I, I've given up everything to come and do this. And if I thought there was a way that we could do it, like, heck yeah, we'd do it for Pro 1. But I think it would definitely be stacked against us. And it's really something you don't appreciate until you come over here and you see, like, Vaughn's guys standing on turn one with a speed gun and like logging every single run. You see Papadakis' guys there like filming every run, getting data off every single car that runs. And you truly appreciate like just how close this is. Watching it from the other side of the world, you don't really see all the craziness that goes into this. But when you've got like tire guys coming over and saying that like, you need to get a, a 307 second like split through the sector of the track or you won't be competitive. Mm. Like it's, just, it's not just for lols. It's because like that's how dialed in these cars are. It is freaking absurd. Like as far as it goes in Australia, like the only motorsport we have that's like this is, is V8 supercars. It's, yeah, which is awesome. It's, it's not drifting. It's not Formula Four. It's not Cup cars. This is like V8 supercar level shit. In some degrees, even in Pro Two, with like the the level of skill and money that's getting thrown around in Pro Two and definitely in Pro One, like it's. It's V8 supercar level stuff in Australia. It's just absurd. And that just reminded me for a reason. Uh, your your celebration of uh, your victory in in Atlanta was awesome. You know, you did your solo run, unfortunately, because that's that's how the final run had to be. <laughs> but you you did your solo run, which was a beastly run. It was a top top point qualifying run for sure. And then and then <laughs> the second you got past the the uh, finish line, you uh, ripped that e brake and then just. You know, shot tire smoke in every Donuts direction and... and just roasted those tires. And it was so cool to like the camera was trying to follow you, but it was immediately just done. Like you were pumped, and uh, it was a good, good victory. And I think I think I was talking to Paco or someone at the time. I was like, "Come on, man! You, you have to go near the fans. You have to go near the fans to do that, Josh." <laughs> but you were you were just doing it on the hill. I don't care. Very yeah, cool. I mean, you can you take you can take the boy out of Australia, but you can't take the That's Australian out of the boy. Very Australian from you, indeed. <laughs> That's the bogan life, man. Is that has that how you would say the bogan bogan life? Yeah, yeah. the <laughs> the Australian redneck, you know, mate. <laughs> a hun. Yep, that's it. So, what's our next uh, pro two round? I forget. St. Louis. St. Louis. Louis. Did we do that last year? Yep. Did you do it last year? <laughs> yep. Are you excited? Are you dreading it? What's your feeling on it? Uh, there's a sneaky rumor going around that the track lad is changing, so it'll be interesting for sure. 
I wonder, what did you hear? Is it going to be reverse? Is it going to be the other section of the track, like across the big wide part? Just that it's going to be shorter. I know that it caught them out last year, like with their original line, teams were getting like one pass out of a set of tires. Yeah. And then they then they shortened it up and they changed the line and like did everything they could uh, to try and make it better. But it was still uh, like just too taxing on the tires. So my understanding is that they're going to try and change that to uh yeah make it more competitive for tires and i mean the big complaint that i had about it, i thought it was a very cool and exciting track but the fact that as a spectator you couldn't see the whole track from almost anywhere like there was just it was a weird situation that you were going to miss some angle of the track no matter where you sat which is weird because it's an infield track but it was uh um there was like a weird layout so hopefully they fix that so you can actually see the whole track where where you were watching from because again the judging stand we were watching yeah. from like you couldn't see the initiation you had to watch a tv for that to the tv yeah. yeah and then the final it's in texas is that correct yeah yeah texas might have been so that'll be rid of it. yeah that will be your like your your hometown right now <clears throat> yeah hometown but not a track that I ever get on outside of Formula Drift. Yeah, <laughs> so, what? I don't really get to drive out there. It's right my home track, but I drive it just as much as everybody else. What? Yeah. You don't go. I, I thought they used to do drift events in the infield at Texas Motor. Do they no longer? Lone Star Drift do very occasionally, but they don't run the FD track. Ah, uh, gotcha. Hmm. Because I, I, I mean, think, last... I think Lone Star Drift maybe use it once a year, maybe twice. Wow. Oh. Yeah, because last year they were running it on Sunday. Right after, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yep. which does FD drivers no good whatsoever because <laughs> yeah. the day after. Do you go party with Aaron and Lone Star guys? A A Ron, A A Ron, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I drove there last round a little while ago up at Mineral Wells Airport, and that was fun. That was the first time I drove the Ute in six months. It was the first time I competed in my 350Z. So. Uh, I do get out for some of their rounds. In fact, I think that's the only one in recent memory. But yeah, uh, yeah I see those guys sometimes, and they run a good event. It's nice. good fun. <laughs> I just started previewing some of the Instagram questions. They are better than usual, oh, which really? is saying a lot. It's usually very good, but something about you, Josh. <laughs> and, uh, you just bring out the spice. He, uh, before before we go there, because I know it's gonna. You want to say I, I bring out the thunder from down under? Uh, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't gonna say that, Josh. You said that. You said that. Okay, <laughs> you're giving yourself your That's own the... theme. Or you too, Paco? I was gonna say like so. Uh, I remember you were telling me about this uh, crazy engine you're putting together. Uh, you weren't sure where we're gonna put it on. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Uh, so it's a V12 LS engine, cast iron block. It's the prototype one. We're putting two great big neighbors superchargers on top of it, and I can't. Yeah, and I can't tell you what's going in yet. That will be announced. Brian, soon. can we can we play the Australian uh, national anthem while we talk <laughs> about this in the background? I mean, can you say what it's for or what it's doing? Like, oh, just for just for rowdiness. Uh, yeah, I mean, who's paying for it? Who's who's making you do it? Are you doing it just for you, for your own content? Uh, I'm doing it because I have a sense of adventure, and I think, <laughs> it's, it's, you, a great, and, and I think it's a good idea to spend a lot of money on dumb <clears throat> things, which is why I drive a okay. Holden Ute in Formula Drift. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So, what, so, so it's still yeah. in LS and it's in its design, but like, have they just added? four extra cylinders to the block and then you have to just get a custom crankshaft and custom cams and all that or how does that work or oh, it's an overhead valve still but you know what i mean single cam yeah. uh, oh no. single <laughs> so it's a, a little too loud brian uh with 50 percent more cylinders and <laughs> a a crank that's a meter long and a cam that's a meter long which is like three foot and a bit yeah uh, so, so it's a big rig but um yeah it sounds awesome it's gnarly as hell it's, uh, it'll be a good time for sure so, so it's, um, custom bring the, bring them back in America and you say twin and custom. twin superchargers yeah twin top mount magnet superchargers just because <laughs> all right let's, so what let, hold on let, let's let's cut out the the anthem we don't want to get we don't want to get a copyright strike but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Um, so what I was going to ask, like, what's custom made, but almost everything's custom made. The, what are the things you're keeping? You can use LS pistons. You can use LS valves. Yeah, rods. Yeah. rods. That's but, it. I mean, you have to build custom, like, Water pump. custom exhaust, custom uh, block. Uh, Custom, you know, you can use all the car. accessories, I'm sure, still, but it's just, it's just, well, maybe that's yeah, not true. Sure. I'm not sure. So it's, like, so you're going to have to have a huge ass oil pump. You're going to have to have probably a huge ass Who water makes pump. this? Like, who, who makes this monstrosity? Like, where can people come look look at this or? Uh, V12LS.com. V12LS.com. Go right now, pause yeah, the episode, everybody. check it out, come back. <laughs> that's insane, man. Well, I'm excited to see. Me. Are you trying? Are you trying to put it on the smallest possible vehicle and then just do like insane burnouts, like like a Mazda RX RX three or little Datsun? That was the original plan was to put it in a a Datsun uh, twelve hundred pickup. Yes, but we have been approached by someone that would be very difficult to say no to to put it in something even wilder. So that's what we're kind of just finalizing at the moment because if that comes together then it'll be a straight up good time like it's in a, a dust it'll be freaking rad no no ifs or buts yeah. but if this other thing comes together then <laughs> like holy shit please tell me you're putting it on a tesla <laughs> <laughs> that would prius. enrage people <laughs> on a prius yeah that would be pretty so cool the, actually. i'd be down with that so that, so that sam can enjoy the the overall <laughs> 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 I'm just drive to RS. All right, let's hit some uh, grammars. Are you ready for uh, the Instagram questions, Josh? Are you yeah. tenderized enough? If you want to get in a uh, last minute YouTube super chat, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we're just going to kind of randomly pick some questions uh, in YouTube or Facebook Live right now. Uh, you can throw out a question and we will do our best to get to as many as we can based on quality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I have. Uh, TR Dixo on Instagram says, did you meet up with that Bumble chick or? <laughs> Who's that uh, Bumble chick? <laughs> did you say Josh? Which one? <laughs> which, Josh? <laughs> Fucking dog. It's a, it's a dog. No, and then... so, no, so it came about like we were driving from uh, Austin to Orlando. It's an 18 hour drive. We got bored. Like, yo, like, let's download bumble and just like spin off some stupid shit to girls <laughs> and then like there were a few funny one-liners and i was like oh i'll just like put it on my story <laughs> it ended up being the most shared and highly popular thing i've ever put on my story like you can drop a million bucks on a race program yeah and eight people will care you say dumb shit to bum like girls on bumble and then s screenshot it and share it on instagram and it gets hundreds of thousands of shares wow. it's just like Bumble's what am i doing with my life Bumble's the one where the girls have to choose you, right? Well, they have to message first. Okay. But so, you yeah. just say that you're six foot four and have an accent. They're like, fuck it. <laughs> they get he's, thirsty. He's 6'12, Sam. 6'12? 6 6 foot 12 inches, baby. Uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, I have a question right here from our friend, uh, Grid Life friend, Killeen. Killeen uh. Dreams asking. Is he single? Oh, is she thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a spam account from Paco just for like hitting up your guests on the on the download. Uh, what else we got? We have. Uh, I'm not gonna read that. Rolly the dragon, but good try. <laughs> Jack Aguilo. He's asking, how practical is your ute? Are you hauling your own tires and tools to the track in the back of it? And then unrelated, what's it like driving, uh, drifting right side up? <laughs> Very good. Well, that's why you guys all use dry sumps in America, because your cars are upside down. <laughs> hey. Very good. <laughs> so, you were right on the, uh, on the AirPods, Sam. They last for an hour and 20 minutes. Oh, I told Around you. the money. I told you, there's something Despite about the, the fact that Apple says they'll last for 20 hours. Like, it's complete crap. It I warned you. Because the last time I tried to do an episode on the road with the AirPods, it lasted like an hour, and I said the exact same thing. That's all good. I think, Paco, is it bad? Do you hear Echo? Yeah, he, he sounds okay. He looks better, that's okay. so that's what that's all it, it matters. Yeah. Hey. There you go. That's a, right. That was a thumbnail for the, for the episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I'll give you a thumbnail. Ooh. Uh, I'll grab my headphones if I need to. If, you, if it sounds crappy, I'll get my other No, you're good. That's fine. We only have a few minutes left. Um, 88 Trans... Trans Sam. 88 Tran... Trans Sam. Uh, two questions. What exactly is Vegemite? And what's the deal with Chewies? <laughs> Oh. Yeah, Vegemite in front of you? You sick bastard. Wow. What, what is it? What? Oh my god. <laughs> so, audio only listeners, he's dumping out a gigantic box of single use Vegemites, which is very strange rather than just getting a jar of it, but whatever. <laughs> Double wagon travel with it everywhere. What is it? Can you read the ingredients for us? So, Vegemite is a spread that Aussies use for some reason. What's, what's in it? Contains uh, vitamin B1, B2, B3, and folate. Uh, <laughs> That's insane. Like, what are those yeah, ingredients? Which, which is, yeah, nothing. It's uh, it contains barley and wheat. Honestly, if you imagine like dehydrated soy sauce, it's probably the closest that I could describe it as. That sounds pretty good. It sounds it delicious. Very sparingly, and don't do what I did to a girl the other week just for lols. And tell her that it's Australian Nutella and make her oh, like, no. like lick the packet. She was not impressed. But oh yeah, so if, yeah, if Nutella is like the sweet thing that you know the Europeans like on their stuff. This is the salty thing that Aussies like for some reason on their stuff. But <laughs> Jason, yeah, you, very sparingly. You I've it. never, so. I've never had Vegemite, but I would love to have some. So maybe next encounter. I would. I want to. I want to lick the inside of that Vegemite packet. Jason Clark on Facebook is saying, "It's people." Vegemite's it's, people? No, like that. That that spread oh, thing. Right. He's, it's it's a reference. It's not, some oh, people great. will get it. Yeah, I get it. So uh, you know, it's um, uh, uh, yep. Um, <laughs> uh, Yodis Nato. This is very important. Uh, let's be honest. No one cares. You won Pro Two. The real headline is that you lost in an arm wrestling match to Frederick Osbo. How does it feel to let Australian down? Hits, man. What happened, it's... man? <sighs> <laughs> uh, how, how did I ask this diplomatically? <laughs> So, like every year after uh, former drift at Road Atlanta, we have a huge Airbnb together, and we all just like go and hang out on the Sunday and have a, a Sunday fun day before everyone flies out. And then somehow or another, someone was like, "You and Frederick should arm wrestle," and I was like, "Okay, that sounds fine." And so we ended up arm wrestling at a kids' table that was maybe half the height of like my knee and the floor. So literally, my knees were like up here. And we threw down from arm wrestle for a few minutes. I have no idea why. <laughs> but you were bested by Freddie, who doesn't have the uh, the physique that I would say you do. But I know that arm wrestling is not about visual size. It's about, it's about strategy and angle. And you know. I would argue that he stood up halfway through it and then just like went on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. uh, anyone, anyone in YouTube, Facebook got some goodies? Let's Why does Josh see. Robinson's Ute on Forza is from Jared Bukhaji? I'm making that last name pronunciation. That's a good one. Why does Josh Robinson's Ute on Forza have such a small windshield wiper? Drifting in the rain on Suzuka. It's not comp. It's not compensating. Yeah. yeah. It's all relative. If you put it on an S chassis, you hang up like an RC aerial. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, uh, he's right. It did have a, a small windshield wiper that year. That's incredibly observant. And we now run a nine-inch windshield wiper. I run a nine-inch myself. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, nine feet, I said, but good to know, sir. So. <laughs> yeah, in case you're interested, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, Josh. Well, it must be cold in California. <laughs> must be cold in California, is that what he said? <laughs> yeah. Classic. Classic Ryan. Anything you want to say to the uh, universe before we uh, let you go get back to your Texas fun? Uh, yeah, actually, there is one thing. If you guys could all help me out with something really small, it would Absolutely. be amazing. Uh, let me just check what time it is. Hang on. It is 11 p.m. where you are, I believe, right? 9 p.m. PST. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, so 
back home at the moment, it's midday in Perth. You guys may have like seen or heard online about a dude named Danny who had a really bad accident in Japan last year. Uh, he's now quadriplegic. He's still in hospital like six months later. He had his first day out of hospital last week, which is really exciting, but he's still in hospital. If you guys could throw him a follow for me on Instagram, uh, just follow his amazing story. It's some heartwarming shit to see like someone have such a tragic accident. Like, we spoke about Turk and all that like craziness that, that went on for him. Like it's it's the same and a hundred fall for Danny. Straight up one of the nicest guys. I was fortunate enough to get to hang out with him a bunch. The crazy thing about that story is that like he grew up thirty minutes from where I lived in Perth and I didn't actually meet him until I met him in an upside down car in Japan. So uh, I got I was fortunate enough to hang out with him a whole bunch in Perth over Christmas and straight up one of the nicest guys you could ever hope to meet. So if you guys could be so kind as to like throw him a follow on Instagram, follow his story of recovery. It's like some truly incredible stuff, what technology can do these days, and yeah. check that out. We'll make sure oh, that we're hearing about it. Uh, how do we follow Danny? Uh, so his username is Danny25. Danny25. D-A-N-N-Y. Uh, it's second. spelled out. It's spelled out in the letters uh, wise. Not Danny, the number at 25. It's D A N N Y E W O F I V E. And without getting into too many unnecessary details, Danny was in a car accident in Japan, drifting, if what I recall. Yeah, that's right. Honestly, like he's super chill. I'm sure he wouldn't mind us talking about it. But yeah, basically, uh, like he rolled a drift car that didn't have a cage in it, uh, severed his spinal cord, and is now quadriplegic. Uh, he's been in hospital for six months because that's <laughs> how long that takes to be able to like do anything for yourself. So uh, absolutely killing on the recovery front, but obviously still has a long way to go. Hopefully we'll get him back into a drift car at, at some point, which would be phenomenal. But yeah, if you guys could um, just throw a follow, like just check out his story, why I'm such a big advocate for safety gear in, in race cars. Um, I'm sure he'd appreciate the support. It would mean a, the world to him and to me. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure to, we'll make sure to share, share links to to his Instagram as well on, on this episode. So look at, if you're listening to this, look up on the description and uh, uh, there'll be the links for, for Danny. Oh, awesome. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for spending the time with us. I uh, can't wait to see what you pull out in St. Louis and beyond. And uh, good luck with the rest of it, man. And uh, good luck with the V12 uh, LS build and all the other fun stuff you do. Thanks so much, guys. Always a fun time hanging out. Later, Boom, buddy. bro fist. Yeah. <laughs> All right, later, buddy. See you soon. See ya. <clears throat> Hang up on his ass, Brian. We don't like this guy. Oh, but don't be rude, Baka. <laughs> well, actually... He's still here. He's he still here. You say. Oh, there you go. You got to wait, Paco. I know you're new at this, but you got to wait till they're gone before you start being mean to them. <laughs> no, I, 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 he, he knows it's, it's, uh, it's with love. He's a, uh, you know, the, 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 the kisser from down under. He knows. The kisser from down under, <laughs> is that what they call <laughs> yeah, for, those, for those that don't know, he said some very inappropriate things to my girlfriend at the Long Beach <laughs> Pike Bar two years ago. And we, he, we, asked, he asked if we knew what, uh, 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 you know, it was like French kissing, right? And then there's then there's how do Australians Australian kiss. Australian kissing. They kiss down under. And that was... Very rude, yeah. Josh. Yeah, it's very inappropriate. She's still, and we... she's still waiting for an apology. She's been crying every <laughs> night since then. <laughs> she says, no, she's not. Fuck you, Stephanie. <laughs> I will fight for your honor if no one else will. Uh, um, I've, been, I've been awake for like 48 hours right now. I'm really tired. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, before we go, Sam, just uh, want to give uh, uh, friends from WiseFab a big shout out. Because guess what, Sam? What? We got WiseFab for the 2JC C3 Corvette build. But that doesn't affect me. Can I have WiseFab for my drift car that I haven't driven in two years? Maybe if you start driving it. I mean, they, I'm sure they would love to get some mad angle kits on the... All right. The I'll allow the shout out then, as long as there's future promise of some WiseFab hookups. That's right. <laughs> you know, been, we've, we've talked about WiseFab many times in the show, yeah. and I think we've even spoken with a couple of their dudes. And, yeah, they, uh, that's they very support, exciting for you, Paco. They support Corey's car. Uh, they obviously, um, they just uh, uh, publicly, I mean, I, I can just make it public now because it, I, we got the kit. Uh, we're doing an S14 conversion 
on the on the C3 Corvette. And uh, uh, what? Wait, what are you converting to S14? Yeah, the whole front suspension on the Corvette. Front yeah, it's uh, it's all the, the uh, '70s Corvette suspension wasn't uh, up to par. It's you know it wasn't made for the big angle. So uh, yeah, we got yeah we got the kit on Monday and. Uh, we're gonna definitely uh, keep people updated on the build, how it's coming up. So but it's looking FD sick legal. so far. Um, FD legal, no it's, doubt. It's definitely not legal. <laughs> <laughs> the whole frame of the car was cut, uh, remade. We're making custom uh, strut towers, um, but it's looking pretty good. So if you can, if you want to check some updates, uh, check it on my Instagram. Because uh, obviously I don't want to spam the Maximum Driftcast Instagram. But if you go on at Taco Ibarra, you'll check out the Barra. updates. Barra. That's right. Check out the updates on, on the C3, 2JC, Drift Corvette with Wise Fab. Doesn't get better than that. Heckin' right, yep. bro. That's right. Uh, yeah, what's what's that new with you, Sam? Uh, well, I, I wasn't on the halftime show with you guys, unfortunately. That's right, man. The remote show, but I was I was at Luftgekult, um, the big German air-cooled Porsche car show. <laughs> I can't <Duh. laughs> stop sneezing. Yeah, maybe. I'm dying slowly. I've been awake for many hours. I've literally spent, like, um, if you count the shoot, two-day shoot at Luftgekult, and the editing, I've done, like, 70 hours in five days, and I'm kind of slowly dying right now. And <laughs> I, I tried not to make it show in the audio portion. Hopefully, I sounded as monotone and, as usual, <laughs> uh, but but I'm, I'm about to fall asleep because yep. I'm editing very hard. The video should hopefully drop tomorrow. I've been working very hard on it. Oh, good. Um, yeah, we'll check it out. Yeah, the, the halftime work. show was very, it was an interesting one. Oh, shit, by the way, um, Adrian Cito, 623, with a super chat question real quick. Great one, uh, great one as always. Thanks, thanks, Adriana Cito. Adriana Cito. 23. <laughs> He's already made fun of me once for but butchering his name. Butchering. But yeah, thanks, man. We appreciate it. Um, um, but yeah, I mean that yes. halftime show went uh, pretty good. There was a, yeah. there was a couple little uh, hiccups, I guess, on on some syncing, but. But you got to see what uh, minus my presence, unfortunately, because of that other obligation. But uh, you got to see what was intended for Orlando, and uh, we hope you guys. We'll continue to see that remote show and hope to be back in the flesh at some juncture uh, if if the cards play out correctly. <laughs> but for right now, we still want to bring you the, the BC Racing halftime show. Still going to be sitting. If, if nothing else comes from it, I've got the sickest brute chair and I can do this. Oh, can you do this? Let me see if I can do it. Uh, Look at this. Uh... <laughs> Feels so good. <laughs> Ah, trying to come back, working for the abs. Ready. Wow! For the audio-only listeners, uh, we are we're uh, reclining very deeply in a burrito, <laughs> burrito, uh, <laughs> bucket seat desk chairs, which is very exciting. Uh, we also, of course, have to thank <laughs> our Patreons. You guys are killing it. We appreciate all the support, all the love. Anyone that donated super chat, or anyone that just listens, even yeah. if you don't got a buck to donate, that's fine. If you do got a buck, we appreciate it. It'll keep us going for another episode yeah. as we slowly die in our personal lives. And, but definitely, uh, fi- uh, thank our sponsors. Yeah, AM intakes. Uh, I saw our good buddy Chris at Luft, and he got a Luft. free goofy photo of me over there <laughs> and we got to thank uh link ecu of course uh you can be putting a link ecu on your corvette that's right by the way yeah that's the other thing the the uh, link ecu sent me a 2jc ecu that i'm putting on the c3 corvette so thanks link ecu that's uh gonna make that car i, I hope i hope you uh you add like all the pops and all the additional fuel on diesel like in the supra yeah, yeah. I mean, the... I want to have. I know it's not efficient for a daily, but I want to have my my STI tune like that now too. I just want to make more backfires. More backfires, if I could. And then, uh, grid in life. Two weeks. We have grid life. Minimized. What? Two weeks? It's literally only two weeks away. Yeah, it is very exciting. We are gonna be on the grid in two weeks. They just super. They just released that. their their um, intro video, teaser video for this round, and it looks like fire. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I can say this unabashedly before, they were a partner of the show. They they just uh, had Paco and I come out there to announce with Jared the drifting sections. Uh, we've done that for three years. Is this our third or our fourth? I, don't I think this is going to be our fourth. Yeah. Um, this is uh, the best automotive event of the year. So I can say that unabashedly. And, and if you want proof, before they ever gave us a dime, I said that too, <laughs> four <laughs> years ago. So uh, 
this is not a hack thing. Best automotive event of the year. I don't even know if there's tickets left still, but if there is, get over there. If you're even within 2,000 miles, go check it out. Uh, Paco and I will be there on the mic slanging words. We're going to be with... Uh, dropping bars. Dad. Uh, we're going to be dropping some bars with Jared. Yep. And then uh, Corey, if he gets his car together, will be on track. I'm sure he will. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. He, he showed us a sneak peek of his new livery, which is very fire. I'm very pumped hot. about that. And yeah, check out Grid Life. And, and there's also going to be the event at uh, Atlanta, Grid Life South, which we mentioned earlier, which is killer as well. Mm-hmm. And then a very new one this year. We've got mm-hmm. uh, Grid Life Colorado. So Grid that'll Life. be for us West Coasters. Uh, for people that, for whatever reason, you couldn't afford the plane tickets or couldn't make the trip out to a uh, Grid Life West or Midwest or Grid Life South event, no excuses. There's now one in Colorado. It's going to be uh, a little bit high up in the elevation, <laughs> but it'll be a lot of fun. That means you only need two beers to feel the uh, effects of six. So that's exciting for everyone. <laughs> that's right. And I think that'll be it for. For today, yeah. for us, for <clears throat> that'll be from us for today, Sam. I'm gonna take a long nap, but first I'm gonna put on uh, Game of Thrones again to fall asleep too. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna pay for my monthly one month of HBO so I can watch the whole thing this Have weekend. Have you not watched season eight yet? No, I haven't watched a single episode. Uh, so <clears throat> just Brian was me telling out. me Brian was telling yeah, me tomorrow just, uh, this weekend is the last episode, right? It is, but I would recommend. Have you watched through season seven? Yeah, I. I, I Updated, not that the, was the end. The but, show ended. What? There's no season eight. Just don't worry about it, man. Oh, okay. So just just go to sleep. And season seven was the last season of Game of Thrones. Don't worry about the rest of it. <laughs> okay. I don't want to turn this into a Game of Thrones pod, but I have some strong opinions. Oh, you're on one of how those. The huh? rest of the show is going. Well, I was a book reader. I was a book reader from <clears> back <throat> in the day. But the book's not ready yet. Brian, get him. I know it's not ready yet, but, but I'm not pumped on the writing of this final season, Paco. I know oh. how it's going to end. Uh oh. Yeah, we, we all do, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We're not going to share spoilers in the show, but uh, yeah. before you. I mean, everyone's already stopped listening now because there's no crap between Drift fans and Game of Thrones fans. But uh, <laughs> nope. thank you so much for, for listening to uh, our rambling dialogue and oh. conversations as always. And we will see you next week. I think we're going to have Turk if uh, if all is well. Otherwise, I don't want to make any promises, which is why I usually don't talk about it. So pretend I said nothing. That's and right. we will see you guys next Tuesday. See you guys next or- weekend. Right. And Brian, send us to Oblivion, please. Thanks, Brian. Good- send us to Oblivion. Send please. us!